Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar with Burrow Happold and Vanguardia. Um, it's really great to have you all here. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've got some housekeeping just to start off with. Uh, we do have a chat box on the right hand side, uh, so do message each other there during the webinar. And we have already put the questions that you read, gave when you registered in the Q&A box. Um, so we will try and go through as many of those as possible. We do have a lot of them. So if we don't get to your question, then we will send you a written question um, answer even after the webinar starts. And then we do have two polls in the polls tab on the right hand side. So vote in those throughout the webinar. And now I am going to hand over to our speakers. We have Jim, Ben and Daryl, um, and they all have really different areas of expertise um, in avian acoustics. So I'm really excited to hear what they've got to say. And then later on in the webinar, we will also have an interview with Joe, the sound director of UT. Um, so I'm going to hand over to the speakers now. Thanks, Alice. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Ben from Bureau Happold. I'm going to share my screen. Um, you will see my emails very briefly, which is uh, embarrassing, <laughs> uh, while I get to the start of the PowerPoint. So we talked this afternoon about the venue experience, which is um, about optimising sound and atmosphere in venues, and that can be venues of any type. Um, it could be all the way from, um, you know, stadiums and arenas through to theatres or recording studios or um uh, or, or small auditoria anything like that anything where um the audience experience is is really critical to um to to the event and unfortunately um you're gonna have to put up with me first i'm afraid and i'm going to talk a little bit about physics so apologies for the kind of back to school um nature of the first few slides but what i'm hoping to do is give everybody a very very high level grounding in the phenomena that we look at when we're designing venues um, which will hopefully make it easier to understand some of the really exciting projects that uh, my friends Jim and Daryl are going to co come on and, and talk about in a moment. So some of the key acoustic phenomena that we think about when we're designing venues, the first two that I'm going to talk about are noise breaking in and noise breaking out of a venue. Um, and noise breaking in is, you know, very typically from um, transport sources. So that could be um, aeroplanes, it could be rail, it could be um, road noise. And obviously, any noise breaking into the building is going to dramatically impact your atmosphere if you're um, trying to listen to um, speech or music or a recording or anything like that. And that has massive implications for the, the architectural and engineering design in terms of things like the facade design, uh, you know, the ventilation strategy, the glazing, the roof, all that kind of thing that, that impact very much how much sound can get into the building and the opposite of, of that is is noise breaking out of our development so uh, that will be the noise that's generated by our performance space or our venue on any nearby noise sensitive receivers so if we imagine that we've got a venue where we've got bands playing or djs playing generating you know high levels amplified sound then those same things that we thought about in terms of noise breaking in the the building envelope, the ventilation strategy, the glazing, all that kind of stuff impacts how much noise our neighbours um, receive from our venue. And that has significant implications for things like planning and, of course, you know, just good relationships with the locality. And so very schematically, um, you know, this is this is noise breaking into a development. We've got our transport noises um, and, and potentially our noise sensitive um, things going on inside. Um, and a great example of that is a development which we are almost about to complete this is um the bbc concert studios um in london and i'm going to use a laser pointer here and this is a a, a new um concert hall for the bbc symphony orchestra as well as a new uh, recording studios to to replace made available recording studios and this big rectilinear box that sits on top of the development here is the new symphony hall for the bbc symphony orchestra and it's interesting because um you can't see it in this render, but at the front of the site is an access road to the site for HGVs um, and they rumble past quite frequently. And it might be the BBC's own um, HGVs, you know, dropping off um, instruments or, or kit, but it could be also um, a number of other usages along this site. And this this cranked piece of facade here, you can't quite see, but it hides a roof light, um, which it just sits in this in this cavity here on, on, a, on the horizontal plane. And that's really, really interesting because it's very unusual that concert halls have 
windows at all because they represent an acoustic weakness in the in the elevation and of course um, if you're recording um, you know a piece of classical music and you can hear uh, an HGV going past then that completely ruins the recording but the the client was very keen um, on having a, a, a window in in the development because the orchestra can sit in the same room for maybe you know 10 12 hours a day sometimes and if they don't have a sense of the passing of time it's a really um, difficult thing from a sort of health and well-being perspective so what we ended up with here to stop the noise breaking in from the HGVs through the window was an enormous um, completely unique um, piece of piece of glass basically that's about one and a half meters thick and I went to see it being tested in um, in Germany where it was being built and it's uh, it's quite a thing um, in terms of noise breaking out then you know schematically again we have our um, entertainment noise a drummer or possibly you know building services noise located externally and that's impacting on our on our nearby noise sensitive receptors and what that you know an example of where we've designed that out in real life is this is the factory in manchester which is a big kind of um, warehouse um, venue type project and this external elevation along here uh, divides the the warehouse uh, venue from some residential um, apartments which are which are really quite close they're about 20 30 meters away and so this is a double skin facade um, and one of those skins is precast concrete sitting on um, an array of rubber springs that, that allow the concrete to move actually in, in, in four directions, you know, north, south, east, west kind of thing. And um, it's very complex in engineering, but what it means is that when the sound energy hits that elevation and the, the panels move in, in, in the X, Y, or Z axis, the rubber springs deflect and a lot of the energy is lost as firstly as, as movement and then secondly as heat. So it's, it's very complex to design, but extremely effective at reducing sound transmission from a high noise space to somewhere that you don't want um, lots of noise. The next couple of things I'm going to talk about are sound insulation and room acoustics. So sound insulation describes really how noise is transmitted from one space in the development to any other space in the development. And it's particularly important if you've got a development um, that has more than one venue or performance space, because obviously then you might have you know, a performance going on in space A, and you don't want to hear that at the same time in, in, in space B. And obviously that impacts things in terms of architecture and engineering around um, walls, floors, doors, internal glazing, all those kind of things are, are really important to get right in your venues. You know, a, a cinema would be a great example where you don't want to sit in screen A and hear one film at the same time as you're hearing, you know, noise coming through the wall from screen B. And room acoustics is, is probably what people think of the most when they think about um, acoustics. And it's really how um, sound is, is reflected or absorbed within a space. So if we think about two very different examples, uh, um, a cathedral or a cave feels acoustically cold. You know, that's it, it, it generally, the room acoustics generates the feel of the space, the real experience of the audience. And it feels cold because it's a big volume, so it's a huge space with lots of very hard surfaces, so sound bounces around a lot. And if you contrast that with um, your bedroom at home or your lounge at home, it probably feels acoustically warm. Um, you know, there's not lots of echo and reflection. And that's because there's, it's a smaller volume, so it's a, a, you know, there's, there's not much space for the sound to bounce around. And also there's lots of soft furnishes. There's probably carpets and curtains and, and sofas and all that kind of thing. And the room acoustics is really what makes or breaks a performance space. So, you know, a venue that has a reputation for having good acoustics is, is loved by artists and audiences. And, you know, um, a venue that's known as having bad acoustics will get terrible reviews on um, TripAdvisor and, um, you know, online and all the rest of it. And some artists will, will say that they don't want to play at, at, at um, venues that are known to have bad acoustics because it makes them sound bad. And so schematically, again, just to kind of explain how this works, this is our, our sound insulation. So maybe we've got, um, you know, some, some loudspeakers generating some noise here, and that can either be transmitted airborne through the walls or possibly even as vibration, structure borne through the, the intervening, intervening floor slabs and walls. Um, and a good example of that, if we, if we go back to our um, BBC development, we looked at the, uh, at the outside and we could see the, the, the symphony hall for the BBC Concert Orchestra at an upper level. This is what's going on in the, in the basement. So this is the new home for the BBC Made of Vale Recording Studios, very, very famous. You know, everybody from um, 
the Beatles through to Amy Winehouse's recording at, at Maida Vale. And this development is the new home for, for that setup. And this is what's happening in the basement where there might be a rock band or a drum and bass DJ or something like that. And they might, might be practicing or recording at the same time as just above them through this, um, through this soffit here, the BBC Symphony Orchestra might be recording a piece of classical music. So we can see that the, the, the criticality of the structure that divides them is really, really high. And, and it has to be thought about very, very carefully. And in terms of room acoustics, schematically, um, if we imagine that this is our audience area and we've got a, a performer or a speaker at the front here, what we really want is for the audience to hear as much as possible sound which arrives to them what we call direct. And that means that it hasn't been reflected from any walls. And it, it means it's the clearest sound because it hasn't, hasn't been subject to any reflections. And therefore, there are no delays between the, um, or there are minimal delays between the, the presenter or the performer speaking or making sound and they're arriving at their ears. And the thing that we really want to avoid is sound which goes the furthest distance in a room and then bounces back um, to the people which are furthest away from that surface. So um, in this case, we might make the rear wall, the one that's blue, shown blue here, as a sound absorbing surface, which prevents the idea that the sound might bounce off it and then eventually arrive at this person here very late because that will confuse um, her ability to hear what's going on. And in a performance setting, that looks something like this. So we've got, um, our performer at the here, at the front here, who's playing, um, you know, his piano, and the direct sound that lands on the those audience members at the right at the front of the development will be really, really clear because it's not been subject to any reflections. But what we really want to avoid is this happening: that those same audience members receiving sound which has been, um, you know, generated all the way to the back of the development and then bounced all the way to the front. You know, this this might take half a second, a second, something like that to, to, to happen. And what it means is that, you know, they will be hearing an old note, if you like, at the same time as a new note, which is, really, really blurs the, the performance and, and makes it very muddy and unclear. So what we might do in, in, in support of that is make these very far away surfaces possibly sound absorptive to stop that happening. And a good example of where we've done that kind of thing, this is home in Manchester. Um, it's a kind of multifunction, um, uh, development. This happens to be a, um, a sort of reconfigurable theatre, it's a proscenium arch theatre, um, which has what we call a variable acoustic, variable room acoustic um, setup, which means that there are um, uh, motorised banners that, that sit in the ceiling. And when you press a button, these banners basically unfurl. If you imagine like a fabric flag that drops down, like a large fabric fa flag drops down, and it introduces that soft that soft element into the space. So when the sound hits the banners, some of it is absorbed. And uh, with the press of another button, they roll back up and the, the room acoustics are totally changed. So it makes it appropriate for different kinds of performance. It's very tunable. And the final couple of things um, I'm going to talk about from a physics perspective um, is building services noise and um, audio visual and sound system design. So building services noise is um, you know, a noise which is generated or transmitted by um, the development's building services. So the, the, the pipes and wires and cables and um, ducts that transmit air and water and electricity around the building. Um, it's usually the air handling systems that are the problem. Um, everybody can remember, I'm sure, being at a, a performance of some kind where you, know, you could hear a fan going in the background or you could hear air movement or something in the background. And that's um, a, a significant impact on experience. And in terms of audiovisual and sound system design, um, my friend Daryl's going to talk about this in much more detail in a moment. But but it's critical to performance because alongside the room acoustics that we talked about before, the um, the sound system design is really what what defines the audience experience. It's what people hear. The speakers are what produce the sound. So it's really really important. And schematically, again, this is our building services. Um, noise generation, whether our fan is generating noise here and maybe transmitting it to other parts of the development. And an example of where we've um, where we've looked at um, designing that out of the problem is, is the Spotify headquarters, both in Berlin and London. Um, and this one is the Berlin one. Uh, and the Spotify wanted to use their main atrium as a performance space as well. So you can see that there's a, a drum kit and stuff set up in here, but it's quite a highly, uh, a, a, it's a dense occupancy space. So all of this is, is kind of informal work space, which meant that they were pumping in quite a lot of air into the space so that people could um, breathe and it didn't get stuffy and CO2 was controlled and all that kind of stuff. And we realized through the design that actually 
Um, they were pumping in so much air that people were going to be able to hear the fans and hear the air movement even when there was a gig going uh, going on. And so we introduced a kind of bespoke set of attenuation measures, which meant that the, the sound level from those fans was brought right down. And that's it for me. Hopefully I didn't kill you to death with um, deadly physics. Uh, I'm going to hand over to my friend Jim. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's Jim Griffiths, um, Vanguardia and, and Bjorn Happold. Um, just a quick introduction. I've had 40 years experience in uh, acoustics and sound, and I'm pretty well dealt with many stadia arenas, expos, Olympics, theme parks and, and theatres. So I very much come at this from a practitioner um, a point of view. That Ben's cl clearly gone through some of the physics. So I'm just going to look at a few examples here of um, how we can um, how we can get some um, experience in terms of the atmosphere, and and on top of that, also manage an artist, so I can sometimes see it from an, from the artist's point of view. Um, you've probably all heard of, or probably seen, or hopefully been to um, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Um, I was very fortunate to to work on that in terms of acoustics and in terms of sound and AV. Um, um, from a Vanguardia point of view, and Bjorn Happold actually did a, um, a lot of the structural engineering and, and um, mechanical electric engineering and one or two other services as well. So it was a great one to work on. Um, and we we spent a lot of time understanding what Tottenham were trying to achieve in terms of the acoustic performance they require. Coming out of that, um, something I've developed is the, an atmosphere wheel. And, th and this wheel, whilst showing it for for sport, it also applies to many other indoor venues and looking at all the different um, variables that, that, that affect the atmosphere. And in, say for football, you might be a team. If the team aren't playing well, then actually if there's no energy getting into a space, then it doesn't matter how good or bad the acoustics are. And then of course that generates into the supporters, you know, where they are, the visual connection, uh, the capacity, have you got the capacity right? Do we need to, to um, uh, draw, um, drape some areas off, um, getting groups of light people in, in a particular space. And then we have some of the design ele elements, which is the bold acoustics, minimize gaps, don't have lots of gaps where the energy can flow out, the sound can flow out and reduce and cause environmental issues. Looking at the roof, looking how you get the roof uh, angled so you get the right sound um, keeping in the venue and maybe uh, propagating to the from the away to the, the home supporters. Um, and also a very important thing when it comes to football is the separation distance between where you are from the from the um, crowd audience to the actual view of the play and getting close to to the um, uh, actual sporting activity. And of course, then we can use a sound system. We can use the sounds and how we build the how we build the whole venue along with the screens as well, which is very important. Um, and look at using it not just for public address announcements, but actually building the whole atmosphere and we can do other techniques like involving the sound and and so on so what i quite often get is the first thing to go into a stadium an arena a theme park is you know the client might say i want this atmosphere to be intimidating and banging the desk when they do that and that was from um, daniel levery and and then it's a matter of the sound acoustic and so on to understand what that means how do we how do we how do we generate that brief into something in reality and we have british standards we have what is intimidating one end and it's the sort of design element come somewhere in between and trying to understand what that is and how we achieve it so i think ben as he mentioned a bit about reverberation time we know we've got short where it's a dead type room to long reverberation where you've got the um when it lively um uh, lively acoustics and also we've got to consider about the sound system and how that's got to perform. It's got to be intelligible for people, which is so important. And there's standards available for that. So on many venues, and we, we try and build a, a venue for both sporting atmosphere and also to achieve good sound quality, say, for a concert. And there's a balance, an optimum balance between that in terms of reverberation time, the design of the building, and whereabouts you put the sound system and the type of sound system you put in. So all those need to come into it to get a, a balance between sport and concert acoustics. So this is just a cap of an example here of, well, let's, let's just put absorption across all the uh, roof and then we get reflections. And most of the reflections then actually just come back into the stand that, that um, you, you've, you're generating the energy from. 
um, a better way and something we did at Tottenham, for example, is you just treat a certain amount of the roof um, and therefore we got reflections then going to the upper and lower stand and also going out onto the, the pitch. So you've got connectivity between the upper and lower stands or you've got con a connectivity with the players on the pitch. And uh, if you do some other dis careful designs on the roof, you can get connectivity with the opposing supporters in the, in the way stand. And this just shows the extent of what we did at Tottenham. You see the sound system there, which is also an important part of the whole atmosphere. And then we have acoustic absorption at the rear. And then we have um, perforated um, panel lining. And then there's um, the uh, opaque cladding right at the edge of the roof. Um, one thing we use again, again from a practitioner point of view, is how does this how does does this really work? And at Tottenham, we use an acoustic camera, which is a a, a camera with eighty odd microphones, and you can actually take a picture of what the sound actually happens during a live again an event. And this was a Tottenham Chelsea game, one of the first few that was held in the stadium, and you can see how this that's the big south stand where we had seventeen and a half thousand supporters, and how the energy there generates from there and then is propagated down the pitch to the small uh, uh, away stand as you can probably see right at the far which is generating a certain amount of energy but not quite in the same way as the seventeen and a half thousand people so it's a useful pictorial guide for um maybe the client for example at the end to show this is what we've done and and you know hopefully it's worked and i think anyone who's been to Tottenham would say that the atmosphere is pretty 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 spectacular um, just to, just saying about sound system, just a very quick comment. Sound system is incredibly important. Um, we have different four different types of levels of sound system. Um, and some this is some of the top end ones. This is at Wembley. More recently, we've got rotating delays, whereby you actually rotate the um, sound system depending on whether you've got a sporting event or whether you've got a concert event. When concerts come in, we rotate it so it's in line with the sound from, say, the end stage, or if it's an Ed Sheeran concert in the 360, which they, he did recently. Then we leave them as it is or just slightly adjust them at tottenham you can see it's not just about having um bananas as they call them or line array speakers but it's also about having the sub base so you can get the impact you get the impact for the players what do they want to hear when they come out and um certainly there's certain things when i interviewed some of the players about them coming out what they wanted to hear and and they expect a certain amount of uh, energy as they come onto the pitch so you need good quality systems to be able to do that um just uh, i've been concentrating much on outdoor but we, there's a lot involved with indoor spaces um we completed the dubai arena the coca-cola arena in dubai um which has got its own sound system it's got its own front of house concert sound system and i think we're going to see more and more of that these days with sustainability and and so on and where you've got advantages it can match the acoustics of the hall um less time to install systems and um health and safety issues and so on the O2 to the far right, we were involved with Bure Happold. In fact, Bure Happold were the engineers and obviously the acoustic consultants at the time. Um, and that was probably a good start of some real high end quality acoustics. Um, at the, the bottom side, we've got the, we've got there for the uh, Dubai Expo. And there there was an interaction between lots of different areas. So um, there there was how you can generate different activities different atmosphere in different parts of the building without having activity interference and that's quite important in this particular aspect so that one area doesn't affect another area and one amazing project we're very fortunate to be involved with is the msg sphere um which i'm sure people have all read about and seen um going up in vegas as as, as i speak and um we've been looking at some very very unique uh, pinpointing holoplot speakers to um, pinpoint the sound into various areas and have, have a whole immersed sound. So that's one to, to watch out for. Um, just, to, just a final thing, just something that is important is having soundscaping, a bit like um, landscaping, how you can use, have the venue and have an acoustic motif, a, a sonic motif as you build up. And maybe as people come to the venue, venue, they get a hint of the atmosphere, which you can drill through the speakers, then you can get more of a glimpse of the atmosphere, building and building the, the atmosphere so you get perhaps a partial experience of the event and then as you go in you get the complete sound experience so you can build that you can change that from day to night maybe have different acoustic motifs depending on what's going on the activity and what time of day
Um, so finally, I did an interview with a good friend of mine, Joe Hurley. He's the fifth member of the band. Uh, he's the man behind you two. Um, more experience than I have, 45 years, pretty well been to every uh, arena and stadium in the world. And I caught up with him last week um, just to do a quick interview. I, I, we would have had him live, but unfortunately he's with the singer as we speak. Um, I think he's doing a book launch or something coming up. So um, he's very much tied up with um, the, the Bono at the moment. So um, perhaps we could just run this. It's about an um, eight, nine minute um, uh, interview. And I just hope you, hope you enjoy it. your time Joe and, and, and as you know uh Vanguardia they much look at look at projects from an end user perspective not just this is how you put the acoustic treatment in but what does it actually mean for the band coming in the end user coming in which is why we work with you a lot on on you know what's it like you know, is this right what's it like for you coming in will this work um and maybe you could just give a few examples of some of the arenas for example that maybe you've you, you've you've had experience with yeah that's exactly it jim and that's exactly why i got involved with vanguardia all those years ago i mean it was quite basically to to be um a conduit in the context of being the end user and um you know being experiencing the end user effect and stuff like that it's it's the vital ingredient i think when you're sort of renovating something or you're doing acoustic treatment or you're engaging in a way that it's so important that you have the end user perspective in mind it, most arenas are built multi-purpose multifunctional so uh, the concert industry and music industry is is you know is part and parcel of uh, you know the calendar year for that particular arena whichever it is because it's normally the sporting franchise is the anchor tenant and you do end up you know going to a particular venue um, um be it this arena be it that arena and it you know it depends really on when you get your schedule like for instance i'll take you back to a scenario that you will probably remember quite well which was the um it was the hydro uh, in in glasgow mm -hmm. and um uh, we were performing at the mtv awards mm -hmm. and it it was probably the most horrendous um acoustic sound that i that i've heard in my lifetime with the band and stuff like that so so much so that it was almost impossible to play on stage uh, i know that previously uh, in the context of other artists that were in that were mm -hmm. in the hydro like eric clapton for instance he found it particularly difficult and you know i went to you jim you know cap in hand and saying oh my god can you please do something <laughs> with the hydro because mm -hmm. yeah, it's it, it, it's it, it it's like in 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 a very bad shape you know um and i think and, harvey goldsmith has been back contact me as well i think one of his shows i don't know it's rod stewart or whatever but yeah yeah and i mean it, it was just and that's just one for instance case in point but um i remember like quite a few years later when i got my schedule in uh okay we're going to do this tour and this is what we're doing and uh, you immediately look at at your venues and you you go down the list and you see glasgow and across from it you see hydro and it's an oh my god situation because mm. you go oh we're not playing there how do we end up in there you know <laughs> but uh again having speak spoken with you jim uh, you told me about all of the the acoustic treatment that was done and you know i went and had uh, like a a, a pre-production visit there and i mean sonically it was night and day the change and the difference the acoustic treatment no, that that's the great you. Done, you know i mean it, it was it was just brilliant um really good really good um you know and there's, there's other other arenas that um you know that you you've been involved in uh like for instance when when we get our date sheet again and you look at paris and you see Pali the omni sport the bursi and you kind of go oh my god you know and i mean that's like was designed specific as a sports 
arena like for ice hockey for basketball for, for for everything and a lot of music concerts ended up going in there but they had to do something about the acoustics and i mean i was um thrilled to know when jim called me and said oh we're doing uh, the acoustic redevelopment and redesign for for Pelle the omni sport the bursi i know it's called the accor arena and uh you too we had the pleasure of opening the new revamped um, arena uh, we did we had four nights in there and it was a delight jim i mean it was Good. absolutely fantastic and i mean the importance of acoustic design concept treatment and all of that sort of thing is such a night and day element in in the difference between you know an artist going on stage in a, a proper acoustic environment there's a certain air of being comfortable in your surrounding and you get the best out of the arena and you also get the best for your audience out there because you know the acoustics are not going to be um you know very ambient and very reflective and all of the things that are you know synonymous with with arenas that are not designed specific for the concert music industry mm. you know um that's that's another one of them um you know i mean the london o2 arena jim i mean that was a dream uh and i mean being involved in, with that for as long as i was with mm. every aspect of it um and you know seeing that through from the the very beginning and the great thing about that is that you know that that was a design build and we were involved from the very very mm. start which is the essential ingredient mm. in moving forward with stuff like that you and, know? And, and and it's interesting that that one um we did you know as vanguardia and uh, also bure Happold, who now vanguardia part of bure Happold, um also did all the structure engineering um so it's it's a good tie up for, um, for us yeah, ab absolutely. You can see that the combination obviously worked back then, and it's good to see that going forward, the combination is now going to be very proactive in in future arena yeah. development. You know, brilliant. And and Joe, uh, one thing I did realise about um, you know we people look at it maybe getting the arena right for the audience, but it is also important uh, to get it right for the artist and you know the artists when they first come in when they're doing a rehearsal and i know we've had examples at wembley where we had to do something wembley stadium and i know there was a uh, at staples early days with bruce springsteen so it is important to think about what the artist is getting in, in rehearsals i don't know if you've got any comment on that yeah i mean the vital ingredient really is to please the artists and ultimately artists will find out how good bad or indifferent the venue is or what the building is doing in the context when they do their sound check in the afternoon before their show that evening and um it's it's the thing it's it's it, it's basic basically a decision making process where the artist will turn around and say to the promoter well you know the next time we're in london we have to be in the o2 arena because we're not going to play anywhere else you know or you know when we go to paris we have to be in the accord arena because we know the acoustics are really good in there absolutely jim and you know you can throw wembley in there as well because uh, we we fixed that before we, we fixed anybody else we, we fixed it joe did we fix it <laughs> absolutely fix it yeah and, 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 i mean and both, you know coldplay have just been in there for six nights and i mean a huge huge success for everybody yeah. concerned for the facility yeah for you know uh everything because i i remember the the horrific days going right the way back to um when you know sound abatement and all of that uh with brent council was just mm. quite difficult to mm. um to uh, you know to achieve and uh vanguardia were definitely completely instrumental in making that whole thing work and yeah. You know, it was the start of something which uh, now is an industry standard, Jim, which is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, the latest stuff when we designed the new the new stadium in terms of acoustics, there's some real final details like angling the grass. So if anyone goes to Wembley and you have a look at the the glazing for um, all the executive boxes, you'll see them angled to try and reduce reflections to get a better quality sound. There's no gaps in between the roofs, so the sound stays in there arena and we get great atmosphere for events and of course just very recently we've got uh, a new dmb system in there hanging from the roof um 
clusters whereby the actual clusters rotate so that when we've got a concert in 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 play the the, the clusters rotate so they're in the right angle for for the audience so it, it and it, and Coldplay use that to great effect um the other week like stuff in america and, and things like that this new venue that's coming up in las mm. vegas which yes. you know the msg sphere i mean which will be um like an absolute stunning stunning um venue and um looking forward to working there mm. yeah and, and that's that would be great Joe. you know we've been involved as well we've both been involved from different angles coming in different testing different systems so um i'm really looking forward to to getting that to fruition uh next year and and, and working with you on that so yeah that's that's that's, that's just going to be taking it to the next level which would be absolutely fantastic yeah i mean msg are a fantastic company to work with and i mean the work that they did on madison square gardens as a venue was just it's the best venue um arena um sonically and every aspect of it uh in america now and you know that's uh, that holds true to their um development you know brilliant okay well thanks again joe and let's catch up again soon in the next all right well uh that that was a great interview um thanks Jim. um my name is Daryl Passard. I'm the director at Bureau of Gold and Vanguard, um, dealing on the audiovisual side. Um, I'm just going to talk about um, what the current trends are that we're seeing in audiovisual. Uh, and probably the biggest trend we're seeing is the inclusion of immersive experiences. And immersive experiences, I mean, they've kind of been around for a while, particularly on the audio side. Um, we've I mean, we, we listen every day that in uh, what is probably the default immersive audio format, which is stereo. Stereo was invented in the 1930s, um, but it's only taken, I mean, it's taken a long time for it to become popular. It was only until the 1970s where stereo became quite popular. Um, and that's now the default immersive audio format. But actually as a format, it kind of really sucks because ultimately, it only works when you're on the direct center line between the two loudspeakers. That's when you only get the stereo and immersive effect. Uh, and if you go to a gig, um, there's, it's impossible for everybody to be standing on the center line. So you either tend to hear sound from the left hand side, uh, left loudspeaker or the right loudspeaker, but you don't actually get any benefit from perhaps it being in stereo at all. I mean, ultimately, what you want to do is be able to localize sound to the exact position where the performer is on stage. Uh, and there's a number of ways to do this. Um, I mean, in terms of spatial audio, uh, there, you know, there's a number of formats. And actually, these formats, again, have been around since the 1970s. There's formats such as binaural, ambisonics, wavefield synthesis. Um, and it's only recently that these formats are, are, are gaining traction. So um, you may have seen Apple have a spatial audio with their AirPods under the Dolby Atmos banner, but actually what this is, is just, it's, it's, it's based on binaural principles. And then there's manufacturers, um, loudspeaker manufacturers that are doing a big push into spatial audio. So um, we've got examples of um, DMB Audio Technics Soundscape, uh, like we have in the image there, uh, Alacoustics, Alisa, and Maya Sound, SoundMap. Um, but what's what's really cool now about the tools, the tools again have been around for a period of time, but where they're moving to now was actually creating sets of tools for creative people to be able to create content easily. So we've had a technical, very, very technical um, sound system and equipment, but now it's been put in the hands of creative people. So this is where we're going to get the content, the really exciting uh, things happening. I mean, a great example of an immersive venue is Altonet. So we've been involved in Altonet where we were involved on the acoustic side. Um, but this is a fully immersive venue. It's, it's multiple venues, um, three above ground, including a, a, a basement, more traditional gig-like venue. Uh, but these are full 360 immersive LED experiences. So there's LED on all four walls and the ceiling. And as you can see in the image, um, 
the whole facade can open up to inside and outside. So there's actually external LED, so they can um, do advertising, show things on the outside of the building. On the inside, there's a full immersive video experience. And to couple that, there's also a full immersive audio system in there. Now, these, 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 these venues have been built with no specific stage position and no specific um, way to set these buildings up. It's literally just a blank canvas for creative people to come in and create shows around bands, gigs, uh, absolutely anything. So it's going to be truly exciting to see what people actually come up with and how they figure out how to use this space. Um, yeah, I guess I suppose what we're seeing also is a kind of a step change in loudspeaker technology. So there's, uh, there's a couple of companies out there that are producing uh, what essentially are called plane wave loudspeakers. Uh, so there's Holoplot uh, and EDC Acoustics. But what, I mean, what they are is they're, la they're loudspeakers with a huge number of individual drivers in it. So in, in the case of the image we're seeing there, there's 96 individual drivers in one loudspeaker box, and each loudspeaker box can be arrayed to make bigger and bigger loudspeakers, but each uh, loudspeaker is driven by its own individual amplifier channel and its own individual DSP. Now, these loudspeakers are kind of really can only come around because of the, the, the drop in cost and processing and amplifiers. But when you've got 96 different drivers on a, a loudspeaker, you can do some quite cool digital processing to be able to send sound where you want it. So you could uh, beam individual sounds to different areas of the auditorium, or you can shape that sound. But what it really does is give you complete control of where you set, where you send sound. So then you can create special effects, you can create spatial audio, you can give people that immersive experience. Um, and obviously, one big project where the Holoplot system is going in is the MSG Sphere. Uh, the MSG Sphere, obviously the first one's being built in Las Vegas and the second one to be built at Stratford out in London. Uh, and, you know, what we have here is the largest and the highest resolution LED screens on the planet. There's not I mean, nothing bigger and nothing with the highest resolution. But what's, what's, what's really been really interesting and really clever is actually the LED screen is acoustically transparent. And so those hollow pot loudspeakers are actually going to sit behind the LED display, so you're actually not going to see the loudspeakers. So the loudspeakers will be invisible to you, but there'll be this ability also to flow this 3D immersive environment. So not are you, only are you sitting in the middle of a giant LED dome, you're also sitting in the middle of a giant uh, immersive loudspeaker experience. So it's going to be truly unique. Of course, the big thing is, is that there's no content to put on a a display like this. So obviously MSG have had to create the Sphere Studios, which is a place where people can go and create content for the space. And it's also been announced that U2 will take up the opening residency at the MSG. So obviously we had a great talk from Joe and we really I can't wait to see what Joe's going to put on in a, in a venue like this. Uh, I suppose the next big thing is really about the, 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 the fan experience, you know, about engaging with the fans, and creating um, more of an more of a um, a venue and an event and you know an experience for fans. So, what I mean, what we're seeing with venues is that there's a big focus uh, not only in the audio and the sound system and the, the video and the LED uh, experience, but also lighting as well. So, I mean, nowadays it's expected that there be a, a, a rich multimedia experience in venues, and, and many venues are upgrading their sound systems and digital displays to sort of meet what the fans' expectations are. And also, the venues, you know, today need to be really flexible. So, you might design a venue one day for a certain intent and purpose, but when they actually get to use it they find out that hey a corporate wants to hire the venue and use it for a different um uh, hire the venue for corporate function and then all of a sudden it's a different uh usage and you have to change that venue around and so you know in some ways you know the use of digital displays and advertising opportunities are great for a venue 
Um, it, one day it could be a football stadium with football, the football club branding. The next day it could be branded for the corporate event. The next day it could be branded for the um, band or you know, whoever's playing the gig. So digital displays give a great opportunity in terms of flexibility of how they can uh, you know, quickly change change the the uh, look and the feel of the stadium, branding, advertising. And of course, the big thing behind it is it actually creates uh, revenue generation opportunities and sponsorship, sponsorship opportunities. I mean, so here we've got, um, this is Tottenham uh, with a Lady Gaga concert. And then on the next slide, uh, this is just an example of uh, the, the sort of displays out in the food and beverage area. So again the, the the football branding's gone the food and beverage branding's gone but what we have is lady lady gaga branding for the event but also some advertising for upcoming events as well uh so the next uh yeah i guess the next big thing we're also seeing in terms of venues is you know the creation of the app and the app is great for for many many reasons um you know it's a place where you can incorporate your ticketing so you can have your ticket on the app um it's a place to see and understand what food and beverage opportunities there are. Uh, there's opportunities to pre-purchase food and beverages, pick them up at half time, things like that. Um, retail and merchandise. So these these are great in terms of revenue um, generation. There's also other things you can do. Uh, obviously, information about the venue and what facilities and offerings there are. But also um, the uh, but also it's, it's it's really useful for people who are perhaps visually impaired um, so they can actually understand the venue and understand how they get around the venue before they arrive. And there's also opportunities for branding, um, you know, partnering with Uber or things like that uh, in terms of avenue and re revenue generation. Um, but whilst venues say, yeah, hey, I really, really, really would like to have an app, it's actually quite difficult to implement. I mean, what you're talking about is taking APIs from a variety of different providers and putting them into the one place. And so someone's got to like develop that and support that continually because these APIs change over time. The other thing is you actually need the infrastructure in the building to support the app. So you need decent 5G or you need decent Wi-Fi coverage. So you've obviously got to put, put that infrastructure in to support the app. But if you are putting in decent infrastructure, say 5G or Wi-Fi, it actually op opens up lots of other opportunities. So there's been lots of big trials in terms of broadcast over 5G. So 5G is a very wide spectrum, but um, you can actually license parts that aren't used by the cellular network of the telecom providers, and you can then broadcast audio on it. So you if you don't have broadcast infrastructure, you can then... Um, uh, you know, buy it and, and have it wirelessly. Uh, the other great thing that um, that is it was a pretty cool product from Sennheiser called Mobile Connect, but it's the next generation of assisted listening. And that goes out over Wi-Fi. So if you've got the Wi-Fi infrastructure, you can have uh, some really good things for people who are hearing paired. Uh, you can have multiple channels of audio and also the ability to kind of tailor the sound to meet your hearing impairment. So if you need to filter out low frequencies because they affect what you hear, then you've got the ability to do that. Um, the other big thing, you know, is, is sustainability. I mean, it's a hot topic for, for our clients, but it's also a hot topic for us. I mean, it's at the forefront of our designs. And, you know, people are becoming more and more aware that, you know, you need to look at the whole life cycle of your AV equipment. So that is, it's, you know, it's, the, it's where the materials come from, how they get to you, what's the packaging, uh, and then when you've actually got those uh, those pieces of equipment, you know, the big thing really is the energy consumption and how that has been used and how much power you've been using. And can you switch that thing off when it's not in use? And then, of course, the other thing is you've got to look at it when the at the end of life of that equipment, uh, what do you do with it? And hopefully you might be able to sell that onto a secondary market. But actually, can you recycle it? Can the components be broken down? Can, is there a scheme to actually take to take those um, products back and dis and dispose and recycle of them sensibly. Uh, control rooms are another big thing we're seeing um, in in buildings. Uh, lots of buildings do have control rooms, but they've always been an afterthought. They've always been, well, here's a room, um, here's a bunch of different workstations. Let's uh, let's shoehorn that into um, into the room. But now people are realizing that actually the control rooms are 
There are obviously uh, a hub, uh, life safety, a crowd management, fire um, type of place. But also there's things like uh, for food and beverages, like what, how big are my queues? Do I need to put more staff on? Have we got enough food provision? Um, so it's all about making the building work more efficiently. And of course, if you design it in um, from day one, you can have much better infrastructure. You can use less screens, less displays. They can be more flexible. They can show multiple sets of content. And so now it's people are becoming aware, actually, you have to put a lot more thought into control rooms to operate a building. And just, just to sort of finish off on a couple of slides, um, you know, broadcast is becoming more and more key in, in building. So eSports broadcast is big. We need uh, lots of screen capture. We need lots of facial shots of players. Uh, these are really broadcast intensive buildings. And not only that, there's a live streaming element of that because you might want to live stream on Twitch or, you know, another platform, for example. And then the other elements we're seeing in broadcast are, you know, increased use of extended reality sets. Uh, these are obviously we're using LED screens to provide the backdrop on your image, uh, on your um, show or set. But of course, being extended reality, not only can they show an image, they could also be used for green screens, uh, but also they can sort of extend that set out into a virtual set. So you might have people on an LED screen showing a certain part of that, but then the rest of the image is composited in, in the computer. Uh, PTZ cameras uh, obviously been around for a while, but what's really interesting is that some of the industry heavyweights such as Canon and Sony have now released their own broadcast um, PTZ cameras with full frame sensors and point of view cameras are also becoming quite popular largely because they are now broadcast ready capable Small cameras, which just gives a lot more creative opportunities in terms of um, studios and sets and opportunities of how do you actually use the cameras. And then there's a, there's there's also another big thing in broadcast, which is SMPTE uh, 2110, which is the new uh, broadcast over IP standard. There's only a couple of products that are out there at the moment that make use of SMPTE 2110. So, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not something you can jump on now, um, but what we're doing in terms of buildings is designing the infrastructure in now because things like fiber optic cabling are relatively cheap so you can put that infrastructure in a new building and not use it so the terminations cost on fiber optics the switches cost on fiber optics but if you put the infrastructure in now when you actually finally come to use it that price of switches and the price of terminating the cables will come down in time so it's also about thinking about not only the venue for today's equipment but maybe what that venue might be used for in for tomorrow's equipment and so yeah that's sort of that's the end of my slides but we'll just quickly run through uh some examples of some some products from our portfolio uh, you've seen some of these just pop up on the screen before but we're involved in a london stadium uh particularly as redevelopment for um, football usage from the olympics uh coca-cola arena arena jim mentioned before with its own dedicated sound system uh, the O2 Arena in London, um, you know, that gym that must be going for about 20 years now. Uh, a fantastic venue. Uh, but also, we're not we're not only involved in buildings. We also do we do pretty much all of the major festivals in the UK, including Glastonbury and all of the other bigger bigger festivals. Um, but there's also not big buildings and not big festivals. We're also quite involved in a lot of smaller venues. Uh, so this is Prip Lockery Festival Theatre, which we just did the new studio on, which just opened last week. Uh, Dela War Pavilion, where we've designed a new sound system and lighting and technical infrastructure. And uh, Benedin Music School, which is a you know a very small concert hall as, as part of a, a school. So yeah, and that sort of uh, wraps up our talk. Um, over to you, Alice. Thank you um, so much, everyone. Um, th that was um, really fantastic. So I'm just going to make sure everyone's got their mics on. I think they do. So we have about five minutes um, for some questions. So I will get started. Um, in an old larger venue with odd structural elements, how can you ensure all the audience are having the same acoustic experience? Shall I? I'll tell you, Um So interesting question. Um, and 
the, the, the maybe the counterintuitive answer to that that jumps to my mind is that actually odd structural elements can be beneficial to um, to the audience experience because what what if we think about the room acoustics that I spoke about at the start and Jim mentioned as part of his presentation, what we really don't want is lots of very um, very flat vertical planes which reflect sound because what what can happen then is you can get sound bouncing between various elements that that then adds to that confusing effect that i spoke about and that actually if you've got odd structural elements whether you've got you know structural ties or you've got you know um columns or beams or or boxing out around those things that sticks out and creates an uneven surface actually what happens is that when the sound hits that surface it might bounce off in in all sorts of odd directions rather than being reflected straight back onto the audience so actually um odd structural elements is is not necessarily the worst thing in the world and uneven surfaces in particular are good at scattering sound all around a venue and actually making sure that everybody's exposed to the same um, level of sound intensity. So um, depending on how, how that looks, not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Now, and I think also, and if we just jump, jump in, um, now that we've got some incredible acoustic modeling techniques. So on, a, on, a, on a, a, an old type venue, we've got, we can now look at the acoustics and also the sound system design so, which can give us a very good um, indication of how to get um, a, a, a very good acoustic experience. So I think the modeling techniques now are, are, so, are so sophisticated. And with the job, Dave Parsons, who's um, working for us on the Coco, uh, uh, Coco Theatre, which people probably know the Camden Palais in the old, old days, um, which um, again, is a, a, it's been retrofitted to, um, uh, it's old glory, and um, I'd urge people to go there and, and listen to the uh, sound and acoustics there. Yeah, I think you're quite right, Jim. Uh, I mean, I was involved in the uh, recent new sound system at the Royal Albert Hall, and part of that was to actually look at improving the acoustics in the building. But because it's a grade one listed building, we can't actually touch the the building and the infrastructure and to perhaps, you know, correct some of the acoustic characteristics in there. The only way that we could improve the sound and there was the sound system with a carefully designed, you know, well, well, well thought out sound system. And they've taken something that was a building that um, the people used to complain a lot about the sound to something that now people praise the sound. And of course, that was just done from a, you know, a sound system point of view. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Um, so the next question is, how do you see workflows in content creation changing for immersive audio? Oh, right. I could probably start on that one. Um, and I think I touched a little bit on this, but, uh, you know, what we, we, we've had um, immersive experiences or, or, or immersive video and immersive audio things for, for some time. Um, but the thing is, they've sort of been quite niche markets and they've always had to be you need quite technical people to be able to operate and understand and set up these sorts of things. But what's happening now is the companies are now they've 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 kind of got that that technical side quite established, but what they're now doing is developing the tools to put in the hands of creators. So you might have a fully immersive audio system, but that might not be in your home, or in your studio at work, or on the train while you're commuting. So it's about sort of shifting those tools, to perhaps on a laptop and a set of headphones, and how you can mimic that experience. So you can create your content and then when you get to the venue, you can then transpose it to that venue. And there's big things like a lot of the loudspeaker companies have plugins to um, like the Digico mixing desk. So you'd be able to operate the spatial audio from the mixing console and you don't need sort of, you know, third party hardware or additional screens, etc. So, um, yeah, it's about really putting it in the hands of creators rather than the, the technical people. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I think we've got time for one more question. Um, so what is the main acoustic challenge you come across frequently in venues and how can designers minimize it when building a new venue? Jim, do you want to go first? Yeah, OK, yeah. What are the main acoustic challenges you come across? I mean, the main acoustic challenges, um, I think, are what I described earlier is about getting it right for sport, getting it right for clear and intelligible announcements, 
and getting it right for music. And I think Ben showed about having the last thing you ever want to do on, on a venue for, that's going to be used for, for music is hearing an echo, a long delayed reflection. And if you hear that, you know, everyone wants their money back or in certain places. So get it right. Consider that if you're, you you might design it well for, for, for sport, but consider that you might be putting a very large sound system down one end of the building and throwing sound uh, into the other part of the building. And therefore, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge consideration to, to, be, to, to consider. Yeah, I've got another slight, slight take on that, which is, uh, you know, being involved in the design process with this, you'd think that in a lot of live music venues that acoustics is, you know, would be a, the number one priority. But when you're talking about adding um, sound or acoustic treatment, over hundreds and hundreds of square meters, the cost adds up. So quite often you get, uh, you know, getting this sort of value engineering type um, scenario, but it's something that, you know, if you've got a music venue, you need to think about the acoustics. It's, it's really, really important. It's a big part of the show. So you've got to get the acoustics right. You, you might have to spend extra money just to get that really great venue. And we heard from Joe earlier saying he only wants to play in venues that have good acoustics. They don't want to go to venues that they know are bad. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same for a lot of performers and also a lot of the audience members as well. Yeah, and, and finally, from my perspective, Alice, um, one of the biggest challenges that I come across is is the balance between sustainability and, and and good acoustics in venues. Because we talked about sound insulation, about you know how you prevent sound from getting one space to another space, and that typically comes um, through providing very large, very thick, and very massive elements. So you know, for example, a one meter thick concrete wall, fantastic for sound insulation. It's great, right? You're not going to hear very much on the other side, but the, the you know the embodied carbon cost of building a one meter thick concrete wall is uh, wall is outrageous and um you know it's very challenging to 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 marry up those two considerations and the best way to do it we found is to actually think about the 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 master planning of the development at a very early stage so let's not put our two most sensitive venue um, spaces in the venue right next to each other actually let's have one at one end of the development and then have all the toilets and cloakrooms and stores and all the rest of it in the middle and put our other one right at the other end and then maybe we don't have to have those one meter thick concrete walls and maybe we can just save a little bit of embodied carbon um, through our design process just by smart thinking rather than engineering out the solution well, thank you. That was a really great um, answer. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time for any more questions. They are all fantastic, though, so I will be sending them back to the people who submitted them with some answers from these fantastic um, speakers here. So thank you so much, Jim, Ben and Daryl, for your time. This was really, really fascinating. Um, so, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, and if you want to find out more information about Boa Hapold, we do have a button you can click down at the bottom. Um, and yeah, thank you again, everyone. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.